when you're feeling all alone only you to hold your own no one there to help you only there to hold you down so stop don't beat up yourself cause it's everyone else so don't look down Okay, well, hey there, friends. I hope you're doing great wherever you are in the world today. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Battles We All Face podcast. I am your, well, one of your hosts, I suppose, John Morris. I hope you're doing great wherever you are. We're expecting that Joe will be joining us shortly. I think she had just a, a couple of delays or, or technical difficulties. But I am here, and it is uh, Wednesday. It's actually Tuesday when we're recording this, but it is Wednesday, obviously, when you guys will be seeing this. In today's show, we are talking about self-reliance, which was a concept and an idea that uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson coined, I think, back in the like, 1930s and things. Uh, and there's so much great information that's there. Um, you know, we're also going to be talking about the importance of being offline, which is something that I think many people around the world are really, really struggling with at the moment, especially with millennials and with teenagers and the generation that comes after that. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the health benefits of being offline, but also the good stuff, the uh, the actually the, the negatives of being online all the time, the damages that it does to your eyes, it does to your brain, and it actually does to your psyche as well. But before I get started, folks, I want to tell you about the most interesting thing of this week. It's always it's one of our uh, favorite features at the moment, um, the, the most interesting thing. Uh, for me, the most interesting thing this week has honestly been, um, you know, when you are when you're living your life, when you are living your passion, when you're doing all the things that you love, stick with it. I think is, is one of the best things that I can say. Really stick with it because what you tend to find is when you do stick with it and you show to God, you show the divine spirit to, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, divine source, whatever you want to call uh, God. But when you show God, look, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm really passionate about. This is what I really, really enjoy and love. Then you'll be amazed actually at the amazing things that show up. Uh, each and every single day and sometimes it's a conversation sometimes you know it's a thousand pound week sometimes it's ten thousand pound week um you know and it's really really wonderful and amazing when you get to that point in your life you know and, and this is the advice i think i'm i'm uh, I'm, I'm telling to everybody and I'm, I'm teaching in in many many different ways is find that thing that you're passionate about and that you love and figure out a way to make money from it and, uh, you know, people will come back and will say, well, John, you know, uh, what about if I can't make, you know, money from it? And, and then I would say, well, you know, you then need to ask, you know, is what, what you're passionate about, is it a viable service to other people? And if it's not, then how can you make it a viable service to other people? So that's something that I've really found uh, so, so wonderful, you know, in this past week, that amazing things can happen um, at times when you least, least expect it. And the less you actually look for these things, the more they actually show up, which is just phenomenal. So... The first thing that we're going to talk about on today's show, folks, is let's have a look. Uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of being offline. Now, when Jill gets here, um, which I'm hoping she does, um, you know, it's going to be a really, really fantastic subject because she's just actually taken quite a, an extensive holiday, an extensive break from the world of social media. Now, if you know Jill the way that I do, you know, you know that she's always on social media. She's always doing interviews. You know, she's always really, really busy, much the same I was when I began as well. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, she'll tell you in her own words, I'm sure, but it's actually really damaging uh, to be on social media so much. I know when I began uh, Art From The Heart, you know, gosh, uh, particularly online, maybe I want to say 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, whenever I was beginning, 
um, I found that I would spend, you know, 16 hours a day for three years solid, just building this stuff up, learning, absorbing every single thing that I could uh, in order to, uh, you know, really develop something. And I learned more things on how not to do something than I did actually on, on how to do something. Um, you know, and, and it's social media at its core is, it, it is really wonderful. It, it's phenomenal on how, you know, something uh, the, the size of this, and these are dried leaves, by the way, your phone is actually a really good place to, to dry leaves because of the heat that comes from it. Um, but, but your phone has more power on it than, uh, than the first rocket ship had that, that you know, that, that went to the moon. And uh, when you think about that, the, the potential is incredible. However, like so many things, it has uh, been given into the hands of, of monkeys and uh, with no instruction manual and no instruction guides or anything like that. And we've just been expected to understand, you know, all of these things. And we are the monkeys, human beings are monkeys, uh, you know, for, for many times they claim themselves to be the enlightened beings and, and sentient beings and things. And I firmly believe that they are, but sometimes they just don't know it <laughs> in, in many ways possible. And, and I'll give you an example. It used to be when people left work at, at five o'clock, they would go home and they would spend time with family. They would have dinner. In the olden, olden days, they would read together. Uh, eventually, then TV came along. And little by little, the family dynamic has begun to really break apart. We fill our lives with so many distractions and then get upset and angry when, you know, things aren't working the way that we want them to. And what we need to do is to become very, very aware of this. You know, it, it used to be when, uh, you know, Zen masters uh, wanted to teach about the art of Zen. They would spend 10 years minimum with uh, the Zen master and it would be passed on verbally. Uh, it was never written down. And what you found with that was you would know that when the person went out into the world, they went out with two things. The first of all, they went out with, you know, extreme knowledge or, uh, you know, in terms of problem solving, in terms of thinking, in terms of genuinely thinking and thinking, you know, Aristotle and Plato and uh, Patanjali and some of these others, you know, they were founding members in the school of thought in, in Greece many, many hundreds of years ago. And now we live in a world, you know, it is the technological age. You've heard me say it many times before. And it's the technological age where people literally want everything, boom, like that. And, it, and it's one click. It, it's the one click era. Uh, and, you know, why take 10 years to, uh, to develop and, and build in, in the art of Zen when you can do it in, you know, six weeks kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and it is interesting. You see, you know, how that is playing massively uh, on, on, on families. Um, you know, you, you see all the time that, you know, and again, you know, prime example is I look no further than my own family. You know, they, they will sit there. We, we went around for dinner, my wife and I, a couple of weeks ago. And there was a couple of members that just sat there and they're just do, 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 do. And it's like, I've not seen you in, you know, nine, 10 weeks. Now, if you know me, you know me well, you know that I do not waste time. Okay. Time is, there, there is no other time than now, but time is very, very valuable. The Native Americans said it themselves, you know, we are here only but a few winters. And, um, you know, when you actually break that down, how much of your time is spent waiting? A lot. <laughs> it's a simple answer. A lot is spent waiting. And, and when you actually break that down, you think how much of your life is just spent either in queues or people on the phone or the people on this. But you see this again in, in our society. It's not just families that are breaking down. But again, adults, older adults as well, they have been conditioned this way, all because of this little device. It, it is addictive. Um, and what you tend to find is people now struggle just to hold a normal civil conversation. And, and I do, I find it most curious and perplexing at times. Um, and then I started to examine it. For, for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm many things. Um, but one of the areas that I particularly study, especially at the moment, is social psychology um, and, and uh, you know, why people do what they do and, and how people behave and how lives are ordered, how our society is made and remade, all that kind of stuff. And 
I look at it also, you know, not just from a from a mental point of view, not just from a spiritual point of view, but an, an overall picture, as as the the Buddhists would call it, uh, the yin and yang. And I found it curious. Now I, I jotted down little notes myself. They, they used to say you can't choose your parents, and now it's the literal case of you can choose who you want to surround yourself with. And now, in, in the world in which we have now, literally, as soon as you become bored of one person, you can click and you just go on to the next person. And, uh, and, and because of this, there is very little depth to the majority of people, uh, certainly in our Western world, that, that you would uh, that you encounter. There's very little depth to them, you know, at all. And as a result, they move further and further away from things that actually matter. So they get all this spiritual teaching now uh you know the, it, again it's spoon fed to them you know the 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 new church has become the um the life coaches and the so-called gurus and 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 i've got a whole teaching on that, that that's coming up that's a, a whole other thing um but you do you find it very, very interesting that this is you know it, it's like we've replaced one religion with another and human beings really do have a an addictive strength to their personality and an addiction if you've seen the teaching on addiction um you know it's, it's nothing more than a very very consciously focused thought um almost like an obsession with something I, einstein had it with problems um you know, the people have it with pornography and with sex and with alcohol and with drugs and with business and with work and with family and with people and with food and so on and so on and so on. You can become addicted to anything. Um, but the importance of being online, uh, you know, from a, from a business point of view, we'll touch on that in a minute. The importance of being offline is second to none. From a mental health point of view, it is vital. And if you don't believe me, I, you know, I had uh, some people that have asked me this before, but I want you to imagine that this bottle is a lamp. Okay, so like a bedside lamp or a lamp that you find in your living room. And I want you to ma imagine that this top part is the light bulb. And if I just do this for 18 hours a day, how do you think my eyes are going to feel? Now, logically, if, if you're a parent, you would turn around and say, well, you know, you, you'll rot your eyes, you'll rot your brain, you know, you, you'll end up with severe uh, issues. Well, well here's, here's the thing. When you sit, and most people do sit with their phone this close, how do you think that that's going to affect your thinking? How do you think that that's going to affect your eyes and your mind and, and everything else that's there? Um, it, it is going to affect it in a, in a, in a, in a terrible way, in a, in a very, very terrible way. Um, and yet, you know, more and more people are telling you, you know, spend as much time online as possible. Let's get you online. Let's keep you watching. It goes back to the original point, folks, that we, we fill our lives with so many destructions. Sorry, with so many distractions that are destructive. Um, we move away from the things that really, really matter. And then we wonder why, <laughs> you know, we just wonder why, you know, why things aren't working the way we want, why we feel miserable all the time, why we feel, you know, uh, fill in the blank. And we're feeling, or we're feeling that way because we are thinking that way, because we're surrounding ourselves with that, because we're doing that every single moment, of every single day, um, which I find most interesting. I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Because I know when I take time offline and when I take time off the internet, it is actually one of the best things. And I look forward to it every single week. I spend as little time actually nowadays on online as I possibly can. I go on Facebook um, and I do my, uh, you know, my businessy stuff. Uh, I, I sit and I talk to people, you know, and I, and I do this usually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and then Friday through Monday, I take completely off. My internet is normally off and, uh, and I'll, I'll just, you know, sit and, and write and write my books and, uh, you know, and do all that kind of wonderful thing. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier on, that if you can figure out a way to make money doing what you love, then do it. You know, it really is as simple as that. But I, but I find, you know, at the age that I'm at now, you know, I tend to build more courses, I tend to write more books because I'm not designed to be uh, a skateboard. I'm not designed to be a work monkey. And, uh, you know, what, what I find is people just become so miserable. And they really do. They become insufferable, quite honestly. Um, you know, just, just 
being that way. And eventually you get to the point where you're just like, mm, I don't really want to do that, you know. <laughs> so, I find it uh, greatly, uh, you know, interesting for, for sure. And, uh, you know, Joe, if she was here, she would tell you the exact same thing. You know, she had, a, 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 you know, like I say, a, 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 an extended vacation from uh, from social media and uh, I think she's enjoyed it too much actually um, but but it's true you know social media can be a phenomenal thing but it also is conditioning our world in a very very destructive way which leads me on to um, what social media is used for and this is a really interesting one I don't know how many people have seen Ed Sheeran I'm sure it was Ed Sheeran um, for you guys in the States, I don't know if you're familiar with Ed Sheeran, a uh, popular British musician over here, one of the top um, right now. A video crossed my path the other day that I found very, very interesting. And he said something, and, and I paraphrase, but he said something along the lines of, you know, when people, especially girls, are posting pictures and videos of themselves all the time, he says, that, you know, he just wants to reach out to that person and and ask them, are they okay? Now you might find it, you know, very, you know, initially you might find that a very, very strange thing to, to ask somebody. But upon observing it a little bit more as a psychologist, I began to think about it more and more. And, it, and it's absolutely true because when people are posting videos of themselves, when people are acting out, when people are, you know, being rude and disrespectful, or if they're posting pictures of themselves in compromising situations, and, and many you know men, young men and young women do now, it's, it's usually young women, um, which is another reason that I don't spend a whole lot of time on social media, and we'll talk about that I'm sure at another point, um, but what you find is that it is psychologically a cry, a massive cry for help. Because they're constantly like, I need likes. I need you to like my picture. I need you to like me. And there's this such desperate need now for people to be liked uh, that, that it's, again, another addiction. It, it's highly addictive and it's, it's frightening um, with the amount of people that if they don't get 10,000 likes for a single post, they go to pieces. I mean, they really do. It, it's, it's like the people that study uh, for exams and things, and if they don't get an A or if they don't, you know, do really, really well on this exam, they completely and utterly just lose their mind. And I find it really, really interesting from a from a scientific point of view um, about that. And I, I suppose maybe I hadn't really thought about it, or maybe I hadn't, and, and you know. It, it had, you know, left my consciousness. But how many people are actually putting up photos of themselves, having that cry for help, and then, you know, people respond, but they respond in a negative way. This is the way our society is being created here, folks. We now live in a society, and I'm going to be very bold here, I think. We now live in a society that is so emotional. I don't want to use the word weak that's so emotional, although many would, that is so emotional, that everything offends them. We have a society as well, a government, that is catering to them. Um, you know, science rules the game, and science and the experiment dictates our world. It, it has for a long time, and it probably will do for a long time to come. But what you find is that there was a video of an old man, actually, on, uh, I think, on YouTube, again, that crossed my path at one point. And, uh, and I, I will give you the polite version. He says, you're only one stiff breeze and one sexual intercourse away from completely collapsing. And he's talking to young people here and, and millennials and, and, and the generation to come. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, quite honestly. You know, nowadays, people have become so emotional and so empathetic, uh, which I want to talk about momentarily. You know, they become so empathetic that it, it, it just gets to a point of, are you guys okay? Because I think they're trying to mask, again, we've said this so, so many times before, they're trying to mask um, all these issues and all these problems and all these battles that they're going through. And they're trying to mask them continuously with you know, another idea, another notion, another fixation, another whatever it might be. And 
I do. I find it really, really curious as to, you know, all that's going on right now. Now, you, the, the, I had a friend of mine that was in the marketing business and he said, you know, that empaths are really dangerous. And they are. I mean, you know, the empaths, quite frankly, make up, I think, about 98% of the, the coaching industry. Uh, in terms of life coaching, in terms of mental health coaching, in terms of anxiety coaching, in terms of gurus, in terms of teachers, in terms of yoga instructors, so on and so on and so on. Most of them, if you ask them, would tell you they are an empath and they don't have a bloody clue what an empath actually means. It does not mean to be empathetic with somebody. It doesn't even mean to understand necessarily. They get this sort of cloudy vision that says, well, if, if I'm an empath, then I understand and I've got clear understanding of what it means to suffer. And as a result, I can teach people how to do, you know, something much more phenomenal. Remember the lesson that, that I spoke of earlier on, which was on uh, Zen teaching, that if you haven't been a Zen student for at least 10 years, you cannot teach because it's your reputation. Um, or, 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 yes, it's the reputation of the, of the teacher that, uh, you know, is going out into the world. And so what you tend to find <laughs> is you have a lot of these empaths, they see these courses and they think, gosh, I would like to be like Tony Robbins. Why? I would like to be Gary Vee. Why? I would like to be fill in the blank. Why? <laughs> and usually it's because there's a lot of money in their minds involved with it. Do you know that the average life coach, business coach, whatever, they make about 12,500 a, a year. You can research all this information on, on, online. Um, and, and this is what is, uh, you know, is, is going on. This is what's happening in our world. And when you find that these empaths exist, and you find that they are very, very good, well-meaning people, but you find that, quite honestly, they're trying to teach on something that, one, they have no authority in at all, Two, they have not overcome. And three, there's about as much depth to their teaching as, as anything. Now, everything is teaching, of course. But when I have an anxiety sufferer who's still presently suffering, um, trying to teach on how to overcome anxiety, that's when I get a little bit concerned and as from a social science point of view, a little bit antsy because I'm just like, to me, it's not right. To me, it's dangerous because you are passing out information to people that, um, you know, you haven't actually overcome yourself. You're basically someone who's charging someone to tell someone else about your anxiety struggles. So I do, I find it most interesting indeed. And, um, you know, it, it's, it, it is most, most curious with how our world is going on. Um, and, and what is happening. And, and folks, you know, I'll be honest with you, I think the, the further and further we go down this rabbit warren, the more and more we get away from what actually is the center, what, what is the core, and we do, we miss the mark entirely. Um, the majority of our, you know, civilization, quite honestly, is not self-reliant. And as a result, they are, you know, really, really struggling. About self-reliance, which was a book that was written by Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 1940s, 1941, I believe to be exact. Um, make sure you got a pen and paper because we are going to be talking about some of the, the greatest life lessons that you can learn from this book and from more as well. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things, uh, you know, that, that's going to be in this book uh, and including my, my own observations of what I believe is the most important lesson that uh, anybody can can learn and uh, and why it's important obviously to learn that so folks we want to welcome you wherever you are in the world today whatever you're going through whatever's happening sit back relax for the next half hour hour or so whatever uh, it, is, it is going to be it might be a long show it might be a short show uh, but we're going to have a tremendous tremendous amount of fun so when we're talking about um emerson's book on um self-reliance here is a copy that i have but i've also got it in audio version as well and uh and, and uh, pdf ebook whatever you want to call it nowadays um and, and it's, this is a book that i really really uh, enjoyed uh the audio version of it depending who narrates it and how it's narrated can be quite dry can be quite um quite, can be quite a lot to take in 
Um, however, there are some really key, key things that you can take away from this book. And the first one that I really picked up on, this is right at the beginning of Self-Reliance, which is uh, all about um, divinity. And what we mean by that is, is the divine spirit. So I firmly believe that as, as Emerson did, it is important for, uh, I guess, teenagers, adults, young adults and parents now to have their own experience of God, of divinity, of what some people call the universe, what I call divine spirit, uh, the, the source, the universe, the, you know, whatever you want to call God, you know. Um, and I believe it's really, really important because, as Emerson said, you know, we have had our, uh, the, the older folks have had their uh, experience of God and how God has chosen to reveal himself to them. But now it's important that the, the young uns, the little uns, um, have their own experience as well, because that's how things stay fresh and stay modern. And, and ultimately, it's, it's through that ever-changing expression that we come to know um, God for ourselves, as opposed to just being told what to think and how to think. And, uh, and it's always important to, to really question, you know, the things that are being put forth. Um, so, so that is, you know, one of the, the first things that I picked up on uh, in this book was all about, you know, I, I forget the exact phraseology of it, but it was essentially, um, you know, that the Oldens have, have had their experience and God has revealed himself to them in, in, in a multitude of ways. Um, and now, you know, it is, it, it's time for us to, to have our own experience. Uh, and I think that's really, really important. I'd be interested to know your views on that. Um, the second that uh, Emerson brings up that, that's really, really interesting is about human beings increasing their maturity. To increase your maturity, I think, is one of the greatest gifts and one of the greatest lessons that you can ever, ever bless yourself with. Uh, what, what I find right now is, is one of the most tragic and, and sad things that are happening uh, all over our world is human beings with a doctor um, potential brain settling and, 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 and accepting a checkout, you know, uh, checkout assistant um, level mind. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a checkout assistant if that's where you're comfortable, that's where you're happy and everything else. But it's, I think it's important as well to learn that we all have a very, very, very wonderful purpose here on Earth. And I think to settle for anything less than what you truly are capable of, um, leaves you feeling very, very miserable, to be honest with you, and leaves you very unfulfilled. And at the end of your life, you sit there and you think, gosh, I could have done so much more. Um, so, you know, increasing your maturity comes very, very simply from reading, through study, through, uh, you know, all the different disciplines that we talk about so many times on this show, from inner engineering, from self-mastery. Um, and what I found with myself in, in, in just the you know, 12 months of, uh, of, of really heavily focused um, you know, inner engineering um, is that it's, it's not only possible, but it is very, very likely that you can change your entire life in, in, in you know, your entire life can change within 12 months. Um, and what, what I found, and I think what scientists have found as well, and social scientists have found is that if you study something one hour per day, three years, you will be a master of it. Uh, I spend pretty much all day every day nowadays uh, studying and, uh, and, and developing my mind and developing my body and developing you know, everything about me because at the end of the day, I want to do all the amazing things that I, that I love to do. And the, the funny thing is, the more I develop it, the less I actually want in life. Um, so increasing your maturity is going to happen through time. Um, increasing your maturity is not something that you're going to wake up and pow, you know, you are just suddenly going to be radically changed. Um, the increase of your maturity does come with time, but you can add to it by how you study, how you listen. And I always say to people, study that which you desire to become. Um, I think it's one of the most important lessons that I, that I can teach anybody, um, is study that which you desire to become. Because I find that uh, I, I found a great quote, actually, I heard a great quote today. Uh, bear with me, let me see if I can pull this up. I've got, I've got my little phone down here. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's a conversation that Sherlock Holmes is having with Dr. John Watson. And it, it, it's tremendous. And I think it's so true because I think now 
more than ever, we have uh, people around the world that are just, dare I say it, just accepting, you know, whatever in their life. That there's no, you know, I, I honestly think sometimes we know more as infants and children than we do, you know, when we're older, because it gets conditioned out of us. Uh, and again, if, if you believe, as I do, that you are a divine spirit having a temporary human experience, then you also believe and you also know that you are capable of really, really amazing things. And to that end, uh, I think, you know, you, you see this all the time, actually, and it's going to sound terribly judgmental, but you see this all the time with, with young girls that are going out in the streets of a weekend, and, and a lot of them go out and get drunk, um, and young guys that are doing the same, and basically they're pickling their juices, they're pickling their brains, and, um, you know, it, it's they, leave, they lead a very miserable unhappy and fulfilled uh, existence, which is what often leads to a lot of depressions. A lot of it can be clinical, of course. Don't don't misunderstand me, folks. Um, I'm a social scientist, a psychologist in training. So I'm, I'm very, very, uh, you know, ab able-bodied to, to speak on these things. Um, but I, I find it so sad because I see the potential that's, that's in so many of these young people and how they're throwing their lives away. And anyway, this this little quote from, it's from Sherlock Holmes, uh, it is one of the first stories, in fact, I think it is the first story uh, that was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, about, and I just want to read this to you, if, if, if I may. Uh, let, let, let's see, okay. So consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic, and you have to stock it with such furniture as you, sh as you choose. It takes in all sorts of lumber, and it takes in all sorts of furniture and all designs that he comes across. Well, knowing this, he also knows that the brain can become very, very crowded. And it can become crowded with every whim and fanciful notion that comes along. Now, the skillful workman is very, very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work. It is a mistake to think that such a little space, referring to our brain, has elastic walls and can descend to any extent dependent upon it. There comes a time for when every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before is of the highest importance. Therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing about in one's mind but only using the only using the useful ones. Now, to paraphrase this, because obviously it's an old text. Basically, what he's saying is, your mind is not an elastic band. You know, you can't just fill it full of you know stuff over and over and over again, and expect it to be just all level and all all fine and and, and you know and, and everything like that. And again, it's exactly what I, I've, I've talked about a lot of the time, study that which you desire to become. A lot of people will sit there and they'll watch Emmerdale, they'll watch The Only Way is Essex, they'll watch Made in Chelsea, they'll watch Coronation Street, they'll watch Hollyoaks, Brookside. Uh, Brookside isn't on anymore. But you know, they watch all the soaps and the same for you guys and girls in the USA uh, and around the world. You know, you're watching stuff that has little to, or, or nothing to do with that which you desire to become. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that there is, you know, no room for, uh, you know, for growth and for development and also for relaxation. I think it is important to relax, but I think it's very important to, I think it's very important to be very careful on how you relax and, and the, the very things that you, you know, put into your mind and what you allow to uh, take root because they will take root and they will, uh, you know, have their own image and things. Um, so, yeah, I found that quote very, very interesting this morning. I hope you did as well. I'm sure that the, the person narrating it um, would do a far better job of it than, than I did, but uh, it's on the spot, folks. It's on the spot. Um, so increasing your maturity is one of the, the best things that you can do. Like I say, pen and pencil ready, folks. Um, study that which you desire to become. Um, first of all, second of all, only place into your mind that which you want to see manifest into something. Um, and, and, and study what you enjoy. I think it's really important. At this point, I want to uh, add in uh, uh, probably one of my, my favorite teachings. Um, and it, it's one that's really triggered in my mind over the last sort of 12 months or so. And it is, Perhaps one of the greatest lessons that all children 
should learn um, right away. And it, it, it's, it's, it's such a powerful teaching that I believe it is, um, this should be taught in schools. I think sometimes, you know, lessons and things that are taught in schools are so just empty and, and pointless a lot of the times. And the one lesson that I believe that the children should be taught more than anything is how to make money. Now, what I mean by that is how to build assets and how to um, create residual streams of income. I believe that is one of the most fundamental things because what happens is we're put here on earth with a passion and a desire for something amazing and something wonderful. And then we are taught, well, the only way to access money, which we need to live apparently, is to, uh, to go out and work for it. And that takes us further away from the thing that we love and that we're passionate about and all that great stuff. And what happens is we die miserable, never achieving what we're putting here on earth to do. So I firmly believe that, you know, you owe it to your kids to figure this out and to, to learn how to do it, um, how to make money, how to build an asset. And ultimately in, in doing so, uh, you are ensuring that your children can really live out what it is that they are here to do. I think it's so important to, to be able to do that. Um, and that comes through a, a wide variety of areas. That comes through, obviously, your, your stocks and your, your bonds and things, uh, you know, through uh, the S&P 500s, which, uh, again, I'm studying, I'm learning all this stuff um, as we're going along, because I know that I don't want to work for money. I don't want, you know, my wealth, in terms of the worldly sense, to be reflected by um, whether or not I come to work or not. So if there are days where I just want to sit and write my books, or there's days that I want to sit and build a course or, or whatever it might be, then uh, I, you know, I want the freedom to be able to do that as opposed to, oh my goodness, you know, this is, you know, we, we, we need money. And, and thankfully we're in a position now where because we've saved, because we've worked hard when, when I was younger, and my wife does and still does to this day, you know, we have been able to save. And that has afforded us the opportunity to be able to do this. Um, so, you know, like I said, I mean, I would recommend uh, if anybody is wanting that kind of lifestyle where they don't have to go to work for money, you want to start by looking at the courses that you could build and, and what, what is it that you can do? What is what you call your unfair advantage? That very thing that you can do that sets you apart from other people. For example, uh, you know, I, I have studied psychology online through their courses with the University of Yale, uh, studied philosophy with them as well. Uh, I've studied uh, psychology with the University of MIT. I've studied psychology with uh, the University of Stanford, all online. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, and I'm currently studying for a BSc with the Open University in, uh, in social psychology. So that is one of my unfair advantages, which means usually when, when not only does it open doors to, uh, to reach out to people, but when I open my mouth, uh, people tend to want to listen, uh, which I find highly amusing. The other, the other unfair advantage I think that I've got is I'm from Scotland. Uh, and though I wasn't born here, um, you know, I, uh, I've lived here now for the past 11 years and I've picked up, oh, a wee bit of an accent. Um, you know, I know I was absolutely terrible. And the only people that can actually tell that I am not Scottish is usually the Scottish people themselves. Um, by the way, if, if you're wondering what's going on with my voice, I have uh, been writing a book, which I'm sure you'd be probably sick to death of, of hearing about now. Um, and uh, th this is my narrator's voice. It's actually it's actually toned down a little bit now. But, but what I found was it, it was quite posh and it sounded far more intellectual than my own voice. Um, and it kind of stuck, you know. <laughs> this is, you know, I'm actually originally from England, uh, in the uh, in, in the Midlands, uh, in Huddersfield, and uh, yes, it was highly hilarious when I went down to talk to my wife the other day, and she was like, "What has happened to your voice?" And I'm like, "This is this is my narration voice, dear." And uh, you know, it, it it really just stuck. So whenever I'm I'm narrating anything, uh, you you can almost hear, you know, the the very. Uh, prim and proper. Uh, but like I say, I mean, that this voice actually act, uh, allows me to access uh, words and synonyms and uh, different, all manner of different amazing things that, uh, that, that I, I don't know, maybe my own voice wouldn't allow me to do. So, uh, so that's, I would say that the most important lesson, it is looking at the stocks and shares, it is looking at uh, what are your unfair advantages, what courses could you build, what could you do where you, whereby you don't have to go to work for money. Because I think in, in our world, honestly, in the next maybe 100, 150 years, you're going to have uh, schools 
that are very radically different from what they appear to be now. Uh, you're probably going to have trains and buses and automobiles and, and, and aeroplanes and things that are flown by robots. Um, you know, you, you're going to have, I, I dare I say, it, you know, you're going to have a lot more people that are living out their passions and what they want to do, and, and it's going to get very crowded uh, for, for sure. But I can tell you now that the success will only continue to grow uh, un, until the day that. Um, you know, the, the universe literally ceases to be. I think that the uh, progression will continue to grow um, for, for, for certain. Um, it, it, it's, it's man's nature. Um, so I find it very, very interesting indeed. Um, as, as we talk about, you know, moving on folks, and we're just gonna take a short pause here, have a, have a quick drink. We want to tell you, why don't you pause for an ad break um, to tell you, obviously, that at thebattleswheelface.com, uh, we are radically uh, changing things up and we're, we're very much aware that people around the world are struggling in, in many, many different ways and we want to provide hope in uncertain times, which these times are. Um, so my best-selling book, which is available, well, this is on this side, there we go, everything's back to front on the, on the screen. Um, but my best-selling book, The Battles We All Face, Hope in Times of Uncertainty, is available in audiobook, ebook, uh, paperback, and uh, now brand new in hardback as well. Uh, Amazon are doing a, uh, a beta tester of hardback books, and uh, apparently my, my book absolutely looks beautiful in, uh, in hardback, so uh, do go and check it out. Uh, I think it's on special offer just now uh, till the end of April, maybe the end of May, um, for the May holiday, so it's uh, it's very exciting indeed. But uh, yes, and of course, you know, if you are struggling, do reach out to us uh, for sure. You know, it is uh, very, very interesting times, but you need to remember folks more than anything. And this, this is sort of covered in, in the first chapter of my book. The only place that we ever suffer is our memory and ima our, our imagination. And a lot of mental health fears can be uh, resolved by realizing this and realizing that you know anxiety is caused by fear, um, fear of what could be, fear of what has been, uh, and and also you know I think um, quite honestly, like I said, the only place that we ever suffer is in our memory and our imagination of what has been and what could be, um, and that leads us very nicely on to, to Emerson's next point, which was about intellect. Now, when you realize these things, a lot of people around the world now will tell you, oh, anxiety is normal. Um, you know, all these gender confusions is normal. Um, you know, depression is normal. All these, you know, basically all these illnesses are normal. Folks, I'll be very honest. I'll be very, very, perhaps brutally honest with you right now. And you may not agree with me, and that's okay. But they are not normal. I'm sorry to say they are not normal. Uh, having anxiety is not normal. Uh, you were never, ever designed to be... Uh, ill. Uh, now there are obviously extenuating circumstances uh, and, I, and I completely get that. But to sit there and say, oh well this is just completely normal, it is not. Because then what happens when you, um, and, it, and it may not sound very sympathetic when I say that, but it, this next sentence possibly, you know, will. Um, but what happens when you deem something as normal, it means that then you just choose to not have anything to, uh, you know, you don't need to do any work, you know, and um, you, you don't need to try and find a solution or you don't need to uh, deal with it because it's normal. It's, it, it's normal to be on, you know, 50 pills a day. It's normal to be on, you know, uh, very dangerous and harmful chemicals um, and, and to be taking them and these things are not normal uh, you know the, the suicide rate in our world for children and teenagers is not normal uh, and and I think the sooner the better that we actually turn around and say sorry this is not normal uh, the better it will be because then people will wake up and realize oh wait I actually need to do something about this as opposed to, oh, well, it's normal, so I can just sit there and be anxious and sit there with my head in a, in a, in a, in a blanket and, and everything. Um, but you only know this when you increase your intellect. And that's, that comes to the next point, which obviously uh, Emerson talks about. Uh, he has a, another phenomenal book about this, uh, and I think it's called Nature. And, uh, you know, he, he, he observes nature, you know, greatly. And that's one of the areas that I see children and, and teenagers and all our young folk and even adults now 
uh, missing. You know, they, they just refuse to go out to nature more often than not on beautiful sunny days like what we have now. And, uh, you know, it, it, it gets to a point where you become very, very ill because you're not taking in anything natural. Uh, and whenever you do, it, it, it's like a, a bird that's been in a cage all its life. The whole world seems like a really big place. So you increase your intellect by, again, studying that which you desire to become. You go on YouTube, uh, there's a ton of free audiobooks that are there, and I would encourage you to really look at that um, and, and to really explore them, really listen to what they say. Uh, and again, you know, in, inside of three years, you can be whatever you desire to be. You can be a, a you know, photographer, a world-famous photographer. You can be a world-famous artist. You can be, uh, you know, a, a psychologist. You can be a philosopher. You can be, you know, a, in fact, you can be a multimillionaire just by studying finance, um, you know, and, and learning all about that. And I have done that, you know, so that's why I can speak about it very, very openly, working towards the millionaire thing. Um, but in terms of being a, a world famous artist, you know, I, I have done that. And I did that independently. I didn't use any galleries or anything like that. This past weekend, to, to give you a little indication, folks, let me see if I can pull this up. Um, and this isn't to, to brag or anything. This is just because I'm delighted and I want to show you. But we actually reached, let me see if I can put that up. Okay, so you can see that 204,000 uh, and, and what, 204,000.6. Um, people that we reached in the last 30 days um, and that's that's independently and we've got nearly 500 new people that have followed us within the last 24 hours which is wonderful and uh, I love meeting all the wonderful new people and, and getting to do all these things uh, but that comes as a result of increasing your intellect you know learning how to market learning how to sell learning how to develop yourself learning how to you know, do these things is very, very important. And all the information's out there. You just need to to make sure you, uh, you know, you, you take the time and, and go for it. It's, it's absolutely vital. The final thing, folks, and I'm sure you'll be uh, be glad to, uh, you know, to, to hear the, uh, possibly the end of this. I, I hope not, but uh, maybe, is overcoming insecurities. I think far too often we as human beings, and I have been there, um, my, my screen for some reason is turning purple. There we go. That was a strange little thing. Um, but uh, with overcoming insecurities, you know, I have been there where the whole world seems to expect so much of you and almost unrealistically that it becomes very, very difficult to actually live in the world. It becomes very difficult to actually want to do anything because you just feel that you can never ever succeed. And I, and I know what that's like. I know what it's like to go to work every day and, and know that your best is just not gonna be good enough. I also know what it's like then to, to spend the next five to seven years of your life actually trying to work through those issues um, because they've left so much of a, of a lasting impression on you. And I think it's important for you to know that somebody else's view of you, someone else's uh, rapport of you is just that, it's just their opinion. And just because they're paying your wage, it doesn't mean that they're God Almighty. It doesn't mean that they actually know what they're talking about. Uh, you find many rich people who have made a lot of money in a lot of time, you know, shady ways and, and things, actually know less about what they're doing than, than you do. And that's why you're employed. And you need to remember that they've employed you because they cannot do it themselves or they don't have the time to do it themselves. So these insecurities that we tend to face are sometimes, you know, how we look, how we dress, how we appear to other people, what society tells us we should do, um, what size we are, what weight we are, you know, how we speak, how we talk, how we act. And perhaps because I live a very solitary lifestyle, uh, I mean, I, I live in a little community um, in, the, in the west coast of Scotland, and uh, I'm looking out of my window right now, it's a beautiful sunny day. I can literally walk around the entire community and I may see one or two people. The reality to that is it can leave a very isolated life. A lot of people are going out into work and into the workplace and you have to behave in a very certain way and act in a very certain way. Because if you dress like I do now, as you can see, um, you know, or, or you went into schools like this, you know, unless you meet, um, you would get some very, very funny looks indeed. And you probably get a lot of quite mean comments. Um, but the reality is that because I've structured my life in the way that I have, 
Um, and possibly because I've seen those difficulties in the world. And I know that I want to separate myself from them. I don't want that hurt. I don't want that pain. I don't want those people to speak rudely of me. I actually want to make it through life, quite honestly, as easily and as simply from this point forward as possible. Because I know what it was like to be shouted and, and bawled at and abused by my boss and, and, and spoken very, very critically about all the time and have zero support that was there. I know what it was like to, you know, put my trust in people and for that trust to be, you know, greatly abused, as I'm sure many of you do. And that is what I said to you, you know, I think it's really important that you learn, especially now uh, with social media being what it is, but that you learn how to make money outside of the workplace. That means if you are having such a horrific time with your job, you can actually go and make money elsewhere. And I, and I was saying this to a lady the other day and she said, well, I've got two kids and you know, oh, you don't know what my life is like. And I said, stop. I said, Sacagawea had a child. She was a newborn mother. Oh, she, she was a new mother to a newborn. Um, and she still led Lewis and Clark up the arms in some of the most horrific and torrential terrain known to man. So with all due respect, don't give me any little, you know, piddly, moany, whiny excuses. Uh, I get, yeah, it, it's tough. I get it. Um, I get it was difficult to do it with health issues. I get it to do it with mental health issues. I get it. I have been there. But I'm also the living proof that shows that there is more. There is so much more. And as I've said many times before, you are not your body, you are not your gender, you are not your mental illness, you are not your sexual identity or, you know, whatever it is this week, whatever the latest trend is this week, you are a divine spirit having a temporary human experience. What I'm saying, folks, is you are so much more than the limitations that you put upon yourselves. You're incredible. And you don't know that you're, or you know that you're incredible when you're born, but then somewhere along the way, it gets lost. And when you actually realize that you are amazing and that it's okay to say, I am a genius, I am amazing, I am wealthy, you know, your life radically changes. And it's okay, people around you may tell us, oh, don't get too big for your britches. <laughs> don't, don't lose your station, you know. And that's okay because sometimes on the journey to wherever it is you've got to get to, you are going to lose those friends. You are going to lose those people that are surrounding you. But guess what? There are new people to find. There are new wonderful people to find. And everybody comes into your life for a time and a season. And sometimes that, that is a longer period of time. Sometimes that is a shorter period of time. But it's a time nonetheless. So to overcome your insecurities, I would greatly recommend that you really watch how you think about yourself, how you talk about yourself, how you conduct yourself and how ultimately you let other people talk about you. I refuse these days to allow anybody to say negative things about me. I refuse actually to, to have anybody speak anything negatively about or even to speak negatively about myself because I believe with all that I am in the things that I want to achieve. And there is no doubt in my mind because I have conditioned my mind that way. What is the alternative? And, and you may get some people that sit there and say, you know, ah, that's the biggest pile of monkey vomit I've ever heard. And then I say, well, let's take a look at the difference between your life and mine. In your view, I may be deluded. I may be completely and utterly out of my teeny tiny little mind, but I'm happy. And I will live out the next 120 of years of being happy, hopefully spreading that happiness to other people and reaching lives around the world. You, <laughs> who sit there and criticize, probably will never reach anybody for anything positive. You will never touch anyone's life and you will never live the kind of life that you desire. And as a result, yours, my friend, will have been a life wasted. Who is the true winner out of this? When you realize that your insecurities are nothing more than what society 
sees, what, what one person says essentially, is beautiful, is ugly, is smart, is special. Is, you know, anytime we have words like this, special for example, Wayne Dyer said this best. When we have a word such as special, and I tell you I'm special, which I'm sure you know, in more ways than one, what it means is it negates everybody else. It means that somebody else isn't special. Now, if we're all special, we don't actually need a word like special. If we're all special, if we're all unique, if we're all wonderful, then those words don't actually even matter. They don't even exist. And therefore, we don't need to be insecure about it. I put less stock in other people's views and opinions, and I mean even the, the, even the people closest to me, then I can't even think what. I, I literally do not. If, if it's negative and it doesn't serve me, it doesn't benefit in any way, shape or form, I quickly dismiss it. And oftentimes we'll make fun of it. Um, because when a person is casting out a judgment, they're not defining me, they're revealing themselves. And when you reveal yourself, hopefully, it's a beautiful soul, but sometimes I think the soul gets messed up, messy along the way. So overcoming securities, folks, you know, be careful how you talk about yourself, be careful how you think about yourself, be careful about comparing yourself to other people. As we've covered in so many shows, um, you know, that the whole idea and notion of, of comparing yourself to others just means, you know, you're comparing cosmetic makeup and genetic atomic structure. That's all it is. Um, and I wouldn't worry about it in the slightest. And if people come back at you and you're in school or you're in university and they don't like you because of how you look or how you dress or how you speak or, or whatever, the biggest question you've got to ask yourself is do you really want to be around that person? Because I can tell you now, I think my answer would be categorically no. <laughs> So I hope some of what I have said today has really, really helped you. It is very difficult, folks, uh, doing a show by yourself. Um, and that is why, obviously, we have co-hosts. So hopefully next week, Joe is going to be back with us. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be all ready to rock and roll and we'll have some tremendous fun with whatever topic it is that we cover. If you are struggling with any of the issues mentioned on today's show, do get in touch with us at thebattlesweallface.com. Uh, we provide so much help and so much guidance out there often of which that is free uh, and if you are requiring something a little bit deeper then we do have mentoring in there as well and that is for folks that is it is for family it is for personal it is for spiritual and it is for professional as well and we cover so much um, I'm really excited actually to, to share with you guys and girls the stuff that's going to be happening over the next several months uh, with various partners that are going to be coming on to really help build the Battles Wheel Face brand. Uh, but if you've got any questions for us, please do feel free to fire them in the chat section below. Don't forget to give us a like, share and subscribe, especially for this video. Give me some love, folks, because uh, it is a hard, hard thing to, uh, to, to pull the show uh, all by yourself. And... Um, Sometimes I get a, a little nugget of thought and it goes off in a whole different direction. Um, but I want to thank you so much for listening and for watching if you're on YouTube. And until next time, take care. God bless. Namaste, my friends. We'll see you very, very soon.